Thank you, Patty. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. So welcome to folks in the Gompa and to the folks in the Zoom. First of all, happy Father's Day to all fathers, past, present, and future. Um, and um, this is also, I wanted to say a little bit about the other holiday that is today, and that's Juneteenth. It's Juneteenth National Independence Day. So um, I didn't know some of this information, so this is um, the source of all information, Wikipedia. So um, Juneteenth National Independence Day is a federal holiday commemorating the emancipation of enslaved African Americans. It is also often observed for celebrating African American culture. It originated in Galveston, Texas, and has been celebrated annually on June 19th in various parts of the United States since 1865. The day was recognized as a federal holiday in 2021 by Joe Biden when he signed the, the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. Juneteenth's commemoration is on the anniversary date of June 19th, 1865, when there was an announcement, General Order Number no. 3, by a Union Army general who proclaimed the freedom for enslaved people in Texas, which was the last state of the Confederacy with institutional slavery. So just by way of comparison, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed January 1st, 1863. So two and a half years later uh, is when the, uh, the slaves in Texas were freed. So today is Juneteenth and um, so a really great day for all of the African American folks that are hopefully having a really good time today. A lot of family, a lot of friends, and they can do Father's Day and Juneteenth at the same time. Okay, so um, we're going to talk today a little bit about these four metaphors of meditation. There's many other metaphors, but I chose these four. So Lama places a lot, of a lot of importance on meditation. And indeed, we have a lot of sessions available um, in the temple. We have um, meditation sessions available Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Saturday morning, and I think sometimes in the morning, right? Isn't the temple sometimes open in the morning? Yeah, every morning. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to do meditation. So I thought it might be kind of fun to look at some of these metaphors and see if these metaphors are actually useful um, to us. So these metaphors are going to reference what is known generally as shamatha or calm abiding meditation. And um, so a metaphor is a thing regarded as representative or symbolic of something else, especially something abstract like meditation. So Eli, could we put up the first, put up that, that Tonka? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, this is a um, Tonka, uh, a Tibetan painting. I do not know how old it is, what the origin of it is. I know it's been around for a really long time. Um, I've seen it on many temples um, in India and in Nepal. So it's, it's, a, it's a very common metaphor and a very old one. It's also very complicated. It has, as you can see, lots and lots of things going on. So I'm just gonna talk about the most obvious symbols in it. So the first, of course, now this is the nine stages of shamatha. So for those uh, folks who have studied Genla Rinpa's Calming the Mind or uh, looked at Trelik Rinpoche's Ease, um, Mind at Ease, 
or any of the other meditation texts that uh, Lama recommends, you'll know um, something about the nine stages of shamatha meditation. So symbolically, um, the most obvious, of course, is the elephant. So, and the elephant is representative of our mind, um, the mind that we are trying to train using this calm abiding shamatha meditation. So you'll see that the elephant, our mind, progresses from the very first stage, black, or they're saying it's metal dullness, to white, as the mind becomes more and more clear and more and more under control. Um, Eli had an observation a minute ago that it also goes from black and white, which might represent it going from complete delusion to wisdom. So um, I thought that was a nice interpretation as well. Um, in a lot of texts, um, you will find that the mind is referred to as a runaway elephant or the elephant of the mind. And it's not, of course, very common in all, our culture, but in India, um, the elephant was, and in some countries still is, very important for agriculture and transportation and logging. And a runaway elephant is a very scary and um, dangerous thing, like our mind, a runaway mind is a very scary and dangerous thing. So the second, um, med the second symbol that is really important is the monk who starts out behind the elephant. Uh, and the monk is us, the monk is the meditator, it's you and me. So he or she starts way behind the elephant, way out of touch with the mind, having no control over thoughts and emotions. But gradually, he or she gets closer and closer and more and more in control until finally on the ninth step, the elephant is lying down and in complete control of the meditator, complete control of the monk. Um, the fourth and the third and fourth symbol, of course, is the monkey and the rabbit. The monkey is, of course, representative of our infamous monkey mind, um, scattered, agitated thoughts, emotions, distractions. And it starts out, as you can see, in complete control of our mind, in complete control of the elephant. He's got a rope around the trunk and he's leading it around by its nose. So the monkey is in complete control. Eventually, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. And the seventh stage, the monkey is bowing subjugating himself to the monk and is completely behind the elephant. He gets behind the elephant in the fifth stage. So um, he becomes weaker and weaker. He's also changing color, as you can see. Um, but eventually, uh, by the eighth stage, the monkey is completely out of the picture but he lasts, he's in there for a long time. So that definitely says something about the strength of our distracting thoughts and emotions. The other symbol um, up on the third elephant sitting on the back of the elephant in black is a rabbit. And the rabbit represents laxity, um, laziness, sleepiness, boredom, all of those things. Um, and he is gone by the sixth elephant. Um, so that is a distraction that is more easily calmed than the monkey. Finally, the other major piece is the fire. You see down at the bottom that the flame is big and powerful. And as it progresses along the path, it becomes smaller and smaller. But it is there for a long time. It's there up until right behind the 
behind the seventh elephant. And the fire represents effort. So um, it diminishes over time. But again, since it's there for such a very long time, it says something about our need for continued effort and consistency, and constancy throughout our practice. There are other symbols in there that we can talk about, um, but those are, those are the major ones. Um, it's a complicated metaphor, but it's also really comprehensive. So um, just out of curiosity, um, for if uh, there's anybody on who has some familiarity with this, this tonka, or for new folks who are just being introduced to it, I'm wondering how helpful it would be to meditation. I mean, if you were thinking, if you were, you know, studying meditation and you had these kinds of symbols, how helpful do you think it might be to you? Has anybody got any comments? Um, yeah, I've got one back there. Just a sec. Hello, thank you, this is Sue. And um, I think, uh, Susan, that it's, it's very helpful as um, just the picture of realizing when you begin your meditation, how much effort, it, it really is important. And this is, with the visual, it's, it's very clear. It makes it, you know, it kind of settles right into you mm -hmm. that your mind is absolutely crazy with that wild elephant. And look at the huge amount of effort it takes to begin. So as a beginner on the path, you really have to have that um, secure desire to make a huge effort. Yeah. And then I think as it moves along, the pictures give you the, there's kind of hope, like, like people can do this and it's a visual where you see it getting a little better and getting a little better the longer you move and how that monkey mind, which is such a great symbol, um, it, it just soon, I mean, not soon, but with the effort and all that through the path that it is able to um, take a back seat, so to speak. Right. So I think it's, I think it's visually very helpful to. Um, yeah, I think it also shows us, you know, that this is a process. Right. Right. You go to step There's one, a path. two to three. And what this doesn't show, but which is actually true, in fact, is that it also goes backwards, you know, like that, that. That monkey may be subjugating himself to the to the uh, meditator up there on the uh, seventh elephant, but tomorrow you might be down to number five, or you might be down to number three. So, um, but it is a process, mm -hmm. and it does, um, and it's kind of hopeful that there yeah. is, you know, you you can do it. We can do it. These are the steps. Yeah. So, thank, yeah, I think it's very helpful. So, thank you. Anybody else have a comment? I, I have a comment. Um, this morning, I, I met a, a person that says their first day to come to a, a meditation. And they told me, um, it's early this morning, and they told me, uh, uh, they told a story about how they were meditating for a half hour, which is quite long if you, on their own, you know, if, it's, uh, if you're not used to it. And I he told the story how he was sitting and he goes, and I learned something so important. And then he, and he said, I learned, I can't be still for a second. <laughs> and I just loved that guy because I thought that that's really great. If you can say that, like how hard it is instead of pretending it's not hard, uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He was so honest. Right. And this definitely shows that it's, it's tough. Right. Right. You got this crazed elephant. Okay, you can take that down. Thanks. Um, okay, anybody in Zoom land has some? I don't see any hands. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next metaphor and it's using water. And it's a lot less complex of a, met of a metaphor. So water is a really common metaphor for um, our minds in uh, the sutras and in the texts. 
So, and I just kind of, this isn't one of the metaphors, but this is a sutra that I ran across, which gives an example of how water is used. This is the Uda Kara Haka Sutra called a pool of water. So this is, this is the Buddha talking. Suppose there were a pool of water clouded with mud and trash. A man with good eyesight standing there on the bank would not see shells, gravels, and pebbles, or shoals of fish swimming about and resting. Why is that? It is because of the spoiled nature of the water. In the same way, a disciple cannot know his own benefit, the benefit of others, the benefit of both, due to the spoiled nature of his mind. So suppose there were a pool of water, clear and free from trash. A man with good eyesight standing there on the bank would see shells, gravels, and pebbles, and also shoals of fish swimming about and resting. Why is that? It is because of the unspoiled nature of the water. In the same way, a disciple would know his own benefit, the benefit of others, the benefit of both, due to the unspoiled nature of his mind. So that's just an example of how water is used in some of the sutras. So there is a meditation in a book that some of us are studying by Ken McLeod called Wake Up to Your Life. And um, it uses, he uses a metaphor of water in here. Um, and it might resonate with some people more because a little bit less complex, but it's also very thorough. So, um, let me, where's my page? So this is kind of the summary of it. He says, a stream begins as a small, because this is building momentum. A stream begins as a small trickle high in the mountains and develops volume and momentum until it becomes a powerful river and merges with the vastness of the ocean. Attention develops momentum in a similar way. And using the metaphor of a river, we can distinguish five stages in its development. So here's stage one, cascade down a rock face. As water cascades down a rock face, it splashes from rock to rock. At this stage of meditation, the subjective experience is chaos. Thoughts bounce all over the place. There is no sense of flow or continuity in attention. So, and you know, and we've all seen this, right? I mean, anybody who's been anywhere where there's um, a waterfall, right? You just see the water bouncing all over the place. There is no continuity and it's just chaotic. So the second stage he calls a torrent in a gorge. Attention is like water in a gorge. We experience direction in the practice. Though roiled and turbulent, the direction of flow is clear. So it's starting to funnel through a gorge, big gorge, small gorge, whatever, but it's starting to funnel. It's going in one direction. Periods of mindfulness become longer while interruptions and distractions are shorter. Though it is rough, raw, and far from stable, attention is forming. Okay, so we've also seen that, right? You see that as it comes down from the waterfall, it does, it always seems to funnel and start going in one direction. So stage three, a river with rapids. Mindfulness stabilizes and awareness begins to develop. We can begin to relax. This stage is like a river coming out of a gorge. It flows quietly for a time and then goes over some rapids. After the rapids, it flows quietly again, 
until it hits the next set of rapids. Busyness and dullness arise, but we know how to return to attention. The unruly monkey mind comes under some control. We relax and rest with the breath. So whitewater, right? Going whitewater rafting, maybe stage one, stage two, you know, not heavy duty stage four, but you know, maybe a stage two whitewater rafting trip. Bounce, 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 smooth, bounce, 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 smooth. So we've all done that too, right? Or at least seen it. Okay, so, so that's third stage. Fourth stage, lake with waves. In a lake, the river is at rest. When the wind blows, waves form, but the waves don't stop the water from resting. We begin to experience thoughts and feelings as the movement of mind, not as a distraction from the breath. Dullness and busyness come up, but are calmed without trouble or effort. So think of Tahoe on sort of a breezy day. You know, there's white, there's, there's white caps, but they do not disturb the calmness and the blue and the stillness of Lake Tahoe. They just go back into the water. The water is not disturbed. So that's the fourth lake with wave. And then finally, the fifth stage is ocean without waves. The ocean is vast and deep. At this stage, the mind feels as vast as space and as deep as the ocean. No effort is necessary. The mind rests with clear, stable attention. So that's a more simple metaphor. Um, and maybe we've experienced it more than we have an elephant and a monkey and a rabbit, you know, but so we've, most of us have experienced, had some experience with water. So any comments on that? Whether or not that would be helpful, more helpful than the other one, helpful at all. I like the ocean metaphor, especially. I'm sorry, I'll just repeat it. What'd you say? And there's something that we're more familiar with, maybe personally. Yeah. yeah. Sue is saying it's maybe something we're more personally familiar with might be a little more helpful, right? Any other comments? I like this metaphor because it, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's very evocative for me. Okay, so we're gonna move on to a third metaphor. Hi, Hi so, Susan, sorry. Oh, I no, had no, a no. hard time um, unmuting. Uh, I, I like the, the metaphor a lot. I guess I'm curious about the, the last metaphor of uh, ocean with no waves, because uh, this is partly informed by my experience with advanced teachers. And also I'm uh, reading La Mirad's Love and Rage. And I guess, um, so I'm a little sensitive right now in viewing uh, people that have come to a certain place in their practice as being unaffected or lacking in emotion. And um, I guess I'm, you know, I, I'm thinking of the ocean as like maybe waves would be reactive like white water, but somehow there's there would still be a surging and a an ebb and flow and a a flux. Is um, these people tend to have very powerful emotions that they're able to stay with, and from what I've seen, and able to articulate and be with, express like there's no suppression going on. Sorry, now I feel like I'm rambling, but hopefully I've. I don't okay. know, you fought her to talk to. <laughs> so maybe what he's referring to 
is like when you're sitting on the beach and you're looking like at the ocean way out on the horizon and how calm it is out there, not closer to you where the waves are breaking, but calmer out there and that the mind, presumably all of these thoughts and emotions and feelings are there, but they're not causing suffering. They're not disturbing the underlying relaxation and the underlying peace. And again, this is in shamatha. This is during meditation, which eventually, of course, we need to take into real life. But um, so you're saying that it sounds like, let me see if I understand, you said what I heard you say is that it sounds like there's nothing going on that you're just completely sort of shut down. No. Right. I mean, I think, I think that would be my concern that it would be interpreted that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I see that. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's just, uh, that's being shut down. That's not, that's not being in control and understanding the thoughts and feelings and emotions and letting them come and letting them go and knowing that they're there. That's, that's suppressing. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that's what's meant. I understand what you're saying. It could be interpreted incorrectly that way. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Now let's, I'm going to move on to another one that is even more simple. And um, after this, I'm going to, um, where am I? Wait a minute, I gotta turn the page here. I'm going to invite us to actually sit for using this metaphor for about six minutes and to practice with it um, because it is much more simple than the two that we've reviewed so far. And maybe in a short set, it might, it might actually be helpful, might actually be able to use it. So again, this is um, a metaphor that is from Wake Up To Your Life, the Ken McLeod book that we're studying. And, okay. So this is what he says. The key principle of meditation is to return to what is already there and rest. And here is what's already there. Body like a mountain, breath like the wind, mind like the sky. Let the body be like a mountain, effortlessly still, and a return to the natural straightness of the body, what's already there. Let the breath be like the wind, free, with no sense of restriction, and you return to the natural rhythm of the breath, what's already there, the body breathing. Let the mind be like the sky, open and clear, including, but undisturbed by thoughts, feelings, and sensations and you return to attention and natural awareness, what is already there. Meditation is a constant returning to natural, natural wakefulness and original mind. So let me queue up my little meditation app here. Okay, so. Let's try a six minute sit using this metaphor. Sit comfortably while feeling stable and strong and straight. Body like a mountain. Just notice how that feels. Okay. 
Now feel your breath. Follow the breath as whatever your usual custom is, uh, whether it's as your diaphragm moves up and down, your stomach moves in and out, or as the breath comes and leaves the nostrils, whatever your what you usually use. Breath like the wind. Now let your mind be open and free from the disturbances of thoughts and feelings. Thoughts are there, but they're not disturbing the clarity and the ease of your mind. Mind like the sky.
Okay. So any reactions to that? Sue's doing a thumbs up, two thumbs up, yeah. Yeah, um, like the body like a mountain thing is really helpful to me, like returning to the body, returning to the body. So that's, yeah, I don't see any comments from the Zoom Charlotte. Yes, I find this a very helpful metaphor. It works better for me than most of the others because it, particularly mine like the sky, the sky is empty, clouds pass through like thoughts flo floating through your mind, but you don't, they're, they're not fixed. There's nothing there. And it, it just feels good to me. It's, it's my favorite metaphor. Yeah, thank you. There's, I remember in one of Chogun Trungpa's book, um, The Path is the Goal, maybe, I'm not exactly sure which book it was in, he has a visual of the mark or the that a bird makes when it passes through the sky, like the bird, the mark of a bird's wing, right? I mean, like, it's just not there, but it must be there, but it's not there. Um, it's kind of uh, the, the drawing on water, you know, when you're, you're making, you're drawing something on water. That's uh, another water metaphor. There's just nothing there. There's there, but it's not there. Yeah, it's very cool. Anybody else? Okay, so finally, the simplest one of all. And this one is about balance. Um, Lama said he likes this one a lot. Um, it's very, very simple. And I'm gonna read a portion of a chapter from Old Path White Clouds. Um, this is Thich Nhat Hanh's biography of the Buddha. Patty read from this a few weeks ago. Um, and this is a chapter that's entitled The Art of Stringing the Sitar. So just sort of by the way, um, if you have not read Old Path White Clouds, what it appears to me to be is bringing the sutras to life. Each chapter is a sutra. I mean, these, these teachings of the Buddha did not like come out of thin air. They didn't, you know, they, he taught because something happened. Somebody did something, something happened and it was a teachable moment. It was something he was able to latch onto and get people to understand and to bring it into their lives. It was experiential. And that's what this book does, is it brings those, like that little sutra that I just read on water, he puts it into context, Thich Nhat Hanh does. So um, we've all heard not too tight, not too loose, and usually in um, the stringing of a lute, well, this is the stringing of a sitar, and this is the way that Thich Nhat Hanh brings it to life. So this is about a young monk by the name of Sona, um, who had just been um, ordained. Sona was a young man from a wealthy family. He is refined and intelligent, but had a frail constitution. He had to make great effort to endure the homeless life of a bhikkhu in which he ate only one meal a day and slept beneath the trees. But his devotion to the practice never wavered. After a year, he was brought by his teacher to meet the Buddha in Savati. The first time in Savati, Buddha asked Sona, so this is their first meeting, Sona, are you enjoying good health? Are you experiencing any difficulty in your practice in begging or in spreading the Dharma? Sona answered, Lord, I am very happy. I am not experiencing any difficulties. The Buddha instructed Ananda to prepare a place for Sona to sleep that night in the Buddha's hut. Venerable Ananda placed another bed in the hut. 
That night, the Buddha sat in meditation outside until three in the morning. Aware of that, Sona was unable to fall asleep. When the Buddha entered the hut, he asked Sona, aren't you asleep yet? No, Lord, I am still awake. Aren't you sleepy? Well, then why don't you recite some gathas that you have memorized? So Venerable Sona recited the 16 gathas contained in the Sutra on the full awareness of breathing. His voice was as clear as a bell. He did not stumble over any word or leave any word out. The Buddha praised him. You recite most beautifully. How many years has it been since you were ordained? Lord, it's been a little more than a year. I have the experience of only one retreat season. That was the first time the Buddha and Sona met. And now this is a little later. Um, I don't know exactly about a year or two or whatever, but it's a little bit later. Now, when the Buddha heard Sona's chanting, because he'd already heard him chant once, he knew that Sona had overexerted himself. He asked Ananda to accompany him to Sona's hut. Seeing the Buddha, Sona stood up at once to greet him. Buddha asked both Sona and Ananda to be seated beside him. And then he asked, Sona, before you became a monk, you were a musician, were you not? You're specialized in the 16 string sitar, didn't you? Yes, Lord, that is correct. The Buddha asked Sona, if you play the sitar while the strings are slack, what is the result? Sona answered, Lord, if the strings are slack, the sitar will be out of tune. And what if the strings are too taut? Lord, if the strings are too taut, the strings are more, are more likely to break. And if the strings are just right, neither too slack nor too taut, Lord, if the strings are just right, the sitar will provide fine music. Just so, Sona. If one is idle or lazy, one will not make progress in the practice. But if one tries too hard, one will suffer fatigue and discouragement. Sona, know your own strength. Don't force your body and mind beyond their limits. Only then can you attain the fruits of practice. So that's not too tight and not too loose. So to know our own strengths, know our own limits, find the balance to attain the fruits of practice. So let's do another short sit and see if we can feel what might be like trying too hard. See if you can feel that getting too tight. And then see if you can feel just in this short period of time, what is not enough effort being too loose. So if you can find a balance We'll see if this metaphor is of any help to you.
Okay, and even that short period of time, I had a lot of too loose. <laughs> Just, ooh, having to tighten it up a bit. Anybody else experience any not too tight, not too loose? Yeah, but that's a pretty helpful metaphor as well. I mean, it's really simple, but you know, that this just really brings it down to the basics. So any comments, questions, observations? That is the last of the metaphors because it doesn't get much more simple than that. All right. Let's move on to closing prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chomrizik, Tenzin, Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, Magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Lo Sang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Okay, a few announcements, yeah. I think. Um, so uh, next Sunday is Lama Jimpa's birthday. So that's really amazing. And I hope everybody that's here today will, will come to Lama's birthday at 11 o'clock on Sunday next week. And um, it's 26, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's in one week. Yes. Yeah, June 26th. So, so yeah. we have a little internal debate about if next week's the 26th. Yeah. So that's a good is. thing to happen because we want to make sure that everybody that, that uh, wants to come is able to come. So you'll be receiving, um, some of you I know aren't real email people, but we'll send out another text and another email regarding this special event because we all need help with the setup um, at 6 o'clock. On Saturday, there'll be a little setup here and also at 1030 in the morning on Sunday. And uh, Geshe Damcha will be here too to celebrate with us. And then the other thing is um, the uh, we have um, expressions, the concert that is just amazing if you haven't been to it with poetry and music and visual art. And it's at six o'clock on Friday, the 24th. And it's also a potluck. So it's a potluck for lunch on Lama's birthday and a potluck on Friday with expressions. And uh, for Lama, Doug's got the cake covered. So um, yeah, <laughs> they we're so fortunate about that. And so if on Lama's birthday, if anybody listening would like to present Lama with a poem or a song or just some words of gratitude, you can let me know through info at Lions Roar. Um, is that uh, how do you say it, Susan? Info at Lions for Dharma Center dot org. Is that yeah, right? That's okay. It. All right. Yes. So thank you, everybody. Well, I, mean, I got oh, wait, one um, too. Excuse me. Susan's got an announcement. As one well. more announcement. Um, refuge members and past members will be receiving an email today or tomorrow. Today, okay, um, with an announcement that um, there is going to be a cultivating compassion workshop, a two day workshop presented by our very dear friend, Venerable Tenzin Choki, um, July 30th and 31st. So um, the email the reg for registration will go out today. And um, 
so refuge members and path members. Um, yeah, D, thank you. Um, the attendance, the numbers of people is limited to 20. So if you would like to attend this workshop, we suggest that you register relatively early. We're gonna send it out to refuge members and path members um, now. And then in about a week or 10 days, we will send it out to the general mailing list. So if you're interested in the, uh, the workshop, please register early. And the registration link is on the email that Patty's gonna send out. Um, and then reminding that there is meditation here, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, Saturday morning, and every morning at 9 a.m. So lots of stuff going on. Anybody else got an announcement? Nope. Hey, blessings, everybody. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you, Susan.